Have you ever seen the lenses we use in lighthouses? Super funky, right? All curved and angular at the same time. But it's not just about aesthetics. That form is functional. These lenses let you shoot a super powerful beam of light while minimizing the amount of glass that you need to do it. They're called Fresnel lenses, after their inventor, Augustin Jean Fresnel. So lighthouse lenses are super thin, relatively speaking, but they're still nothing compared to the thinnest lenses in the world. They are called Fresnel zone plates or just zone plates, because Fresnel didn't actually invent them. He was dead at the time, but still famous for being the optics guy. And multiple research teams have made zone plates so thin that they're just one molecule thick. Now, before we get into lenses that are basically as close to 2D as you can get, we have to understand their 3D cousins. Most lenses work because of a phenomenon called refraction, which is basically making a ray of light bend by changing its speed. Light travels at different speeds depending on what medium it's traveling through. It's fastest in a pure vacuum, slower in air, even slower in water, and so forth. And every so often, a ray of light that's traveling through one medium suddenly finds itself traveling through another, like the surface inside this glass of water. Is it half full, half empty? You choose. And you can see refraction at work when I add a straw. From the right angle, it looks broken in a way that defies the laws of physics. But that's because your brain interprets single bent rays of light as two completely straight beams coming from different origin points. Pretty snazzy, huh? But looking through, say, the side of an aquarium won't help you see something any clearer or bigger or smaller. And that's why lenses curve. When light enters a flat plane of glass, it's gonna bend a fixed amount. And when it exits the pane, it'll bend a fixed amount again. But by curving the glass, you can take advantage of that inevitable second bend to point your beam wherever you want it. If you're Woody from Toy Story, you can collect a bunch of rays into one concentrated source to light the rocket fuse taped to your new friend's back, and if you're a lighthouse operator, you can take a concentrated source of light and beam it out as a warning to ships. Now, the point at which parallel light rays come together after passing through a lens is called the focal point, and the distance from the lens to that point depends on both how much your material bends light naturally and how extreme the curve on that lens is. So to make a lighthouse, you need a lens that can capture light from a source, point all of that light in one direction to focus and amplify it, and do that in a reasonable amount of space. In other words, you wanna make as thin a lens as you can, given your material and budget limitations. To do this, you can't just use a regular lens. You need the fancy ones from the beginning of the video. Fresnel lenses collect light and force all the individual rays to travel in basically the same direction by making use of not one large smooth surface, but a bunch of angular prisms. Prisms also refract light like a standard curved lens does, but instead of focusing all the light down to a focal point, they point it all out in parallel beams. And thanks to all their prisms, the fanciest Fresnels can cast a beam that's visible at least 20 miles out to sea, while fitting inside the top of your lighthouse, no problem. But as thin as they are, they're still not flat, which leads us to Fresnel zone plates. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this SciShow video. Brilliant is an online learning platform with thousands of lessons in computer science, math, and science. And if you're watching this far into a SciShow video, you're probably the kind of person who'd be interested in Brilliant. After all, we have a lot in common. Like, you're getting information from the horse's mouth. Many of the people researching, writing, and editing SciShow videos have masters and PhDs. And lessons in Brilliant are also made in partnership with university teachers and researchers. We are also conscientious of your time. We upload five to 30 minute videos almost every day. And in that amount of time, you can learn something new with Brilliant every day. In SciShow videos, we don't assume that you have the same background knowledge that another viewer has. And in the same way, Brilliant offers lessons for the total beginner all the way up to expert level. And we lead with fun. We sprinkle jokes all over SciShow videos. And Brilliant lessons are full of puzzles and quizzes so that you can learn in an interactive, fun way. For all of those reasons and more, you might wanna give Brilliant a try for free for the first 30 days at brilliant.org slash scishow or the link in the description. That link will also give you 20% off an annual premium Brilliant subscription.
For everyone who's never seen a zone plate, this is what it looks like. It's basically a flat collection of concentric rings made out of different materials. They often alternate between rings that are opaque and transparent. So it looks nothing like a lens, but it can act like one because it bends light too, just using a different kind of physics than lenses do. Instead of refraction, zone plates rely on diffraction to manipulate rays of light. And if you think of refraction as bending, you can think of diffraction as a kind of spreading out. It happens when light waves come into contact with a corner or pass through a slit. In other words, some kind of edge. If you watch a different kind of wave, like one made of water, you can see how the part that touches the edge drags a bit, and that dragging winds up bending the whole wave and spreading it out. And when a wave runs into multiple obstacles, it gets spread out in multiple places, and those stretched out subwaves wind up crashing into each other. Or in science speak, they interfere. And there are two kinds of interference, constructive and destructive. In constructive interference, the waves amplify each other. If we're talking about light, it gets brighter. And in destructive interference, the waves either weaken each other or cancel each other out entirely. So in a zone plate, the light rays that pass through the transparent rings will get dragged on by the opaque rings, causing constructive interference and amplifying the light. It's the same end result as those funky Fresnel lenses, but somehow even weirder. These days, you'll find Fresnel zone plates used in places like lensless photography and sound focusing, but the most extreme versions are currently in R&D mode. And that's fair enough, because they're less than a billionth of a meter thick. These record-setting zone plates are made from just a single layer, aka a monolayer, of certain molecules like molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disulfide. And as you might suspect, they are not easy to make. But over the years, scientists have figured out a couple of techniques that get the job done. One that builds that single layer from the ground up, and one that whittles down to it. The build it up version is called vapor deposition. You can do this a few different ways, but the gold standard is chemical vapor deposition. It's basically using chemical reactions to very finely coat a surface called a substrate. The substrate isn't part of the monolayer, or the lens it will be turned into, but these things are so thin that they need a little support. To coat the substrate, you put it in a vacuum chamber, pump the ingredients that you want in your layer as gases, and then heat the substrate up. This makes the gas molecules react with each other on the substrate's surface and spread across it, creating the monolayer. When the technique works correctly, you can't add any more layers than that, because with the monolayer in the way, your extra gas molecules can't get close enough to the substrate and therefore not hot enough to react. This vapor deposition technique is super useful, but it has its downsides. Namely, the monolayers it creates are pretty prone to defects. So experts wanted another method, and they found one in what's known as exfoliation. Exfoliation comes in a few varieties, but the most accessible is what's called the scotch tape method. To make a monolayer this way, you take an already thin bit of whatever you want to make a monolayer out of, and place it on the sticky side of some tape. Yeah, actual tape, scotch brand optional. Next, you press another piece of tape onto your substance and peel it off to grab just a very thin sliver. Then press and peel that sliver against the sticky side of yet more tape that you have secured to a table over and over until you have just one thin monolayer. And finally, you take that last layer and transfer it to whatever substrate you want to hold it. But if you want a high quality, usefully large monolayer, you have to get a little fancier than that and use a version of the the process called gold-assisted exfoliation. Here, you start by coating some silicon in a very thin, flat layer of gold. On top of that, you lay a water-soluble polymer, and then you put the tape down. Then you pull peeling the gold away from the silicon. That lets you stick the gold to the stuff you want to make your zone plate out of, for example, tungsten disulfide, and then you pull again. And if you did it all right, you now have a monolayer of tungsten disulfide stuck to your gold. Next, stick your many-layered contraption onto a sapphire substrate. And finally, we can start taking this thing apart and isolating what will be our thinnest lens ever. Separate the tape from the polymer, wash off the polymer with water, and apply an extremely gentle acid called an etchant to remove the gold. And voila! All that's left is the monolayer sitting on top of the sapphire. But no matter what method you use to make your monolayer, after you've got it, you can carve out your zone plate lens using high-tech sounding methods like electron beam lithography and plasma etching. Now that we've got our zone plate, you might think we've gotten through all the weirdness, but you'd be wrong. 
because these zone plates function just as strangely as they form. Remember how we talked about the plates diffracting light? Well, when they're this thin and made out of the right elements, they don't just diffract it. They also absorb light and re-emit it. The whole thing involves some major quantum mechanics shenaniganry, so please stay with me. According to the creators of the thinnest zone plate ever, it works like this. When the tungsten disulfide in their zone plate absorbs a ray of light, it excites an electron, sending it to a higher energy level. That electron basically pops off the surface and leaves behind what scientists call a hole. Because the monolayer is so thin, that excited electron and hole remain bound together in a weird quantum way. So almost immediately, they'll merge back together and re-emit the light that the lens absorbed in the first place. Since different elements absorb different wavelengths, monolayer zone plates won't interact with all light equally. Depending on what it's made of, it'll be better at amplifying certain wavelengths. Wavelengths. And there's another wild thing going on here. Because of all this electron action, these super thin zone plates are also sensitive to electricity. By applying the right amount of voltage, you can tune the focal length. Instead of like bifocals or trifocals, you could have basically polyfocals. You could focus on anything you wanted. And I do mean with glasses. Since there's a lot of transparent rings inside these zone plates, most of the light actually goes right through them unaffected, which means you could still see through them to the world around you. So some scientists are looking at this kind of tech for the future of augmented reality headgear. But before that future arrives, we have to make these monolayers a lot bigger. One of the world's record setters for thinnest lens was referred to as a large area monolayer and it was half a millimeter across. Its focal length was only one millimeter, and the team only ever tested with red light. So we have a heck of a lot more work to do before we're wearing these tiny borderline magical lenses around town. But at least we have a solid idea of where to go. Because much like a lighthouse guides a ship into safe harbor, these early successes can guide scientists towards even more exciting discoveries. 